Wow, those were good presentations. Uh, Dean Levy, thank you very much. Uh, Dean Danner, that was very, very useful. Um, I want to thank Professor Boyle and Professor Jenkins for putting together this workshop. It's one of a dozen around the country that we're doing. Uh, Law.gov is about primary legal materials. And there is no concrete definition of what that means. It's, it's a cloud. There's a core and there's some edges. Um, if you look at the laws of the United States Congress, for example, those are clearly primary legal materials. But if you're a lawyer and you go to court and you're arguing about what a law really means, you need access to congressional hearings. And those are clearly of importance in the practice of law and importance for a wide variety of, of professions. And so the laws are primary legal materials, but if you go to the state of Oklahoma, and want to make a copy of the Oklahoma statutes, um, that will cost you $25,000 for a license to put it up on your website, which is fairly pricey. Uh, eight states actually assert copyright in one form or another over their state statutes, and we're going to hear about uh, a little more about that this afternoon in, in the national inventory. Um, primary legal materials are all three branches of governments. The Patent database is arguably the only database explicitly called out by the founding fathers in our Constitution. But it costs $39,000 a year to buy a current feed of patents to make them available on your site. And our current undersecretary of patents, the Commissioner Capos, does not believe he should be competing with the private sector and has an RFP on the streets that would name an official vendor to be the distributor of US patents. And one has to argue whether that meets the language of the Constitution. For the judiciary, Supreme Court opinions are clearly primary legal materials, but one would, would have to agree, I think, that briefs in Supreme Court opinions should be available, and they are not today. There are a few available from the American Bar Association for current ones, but the historical analysis, if I were teaching in a law school, and I want to make clear I am not a lawyer, uh, but if I were teaching Marbury versus Madison in a law school, I think I would require the students to read the briefs that were submitted, and those are not available today. Now, not everything needs to be public. And I think Dean Levy made a very good point on, on some of the issues. There's issues of privacy. There's issues of security. There are documents that are sealed. There are documents that are improperly unsealed and distributed and need to be resealed. And so what is public um, may change over time in reaction to things. Bankruptcy documents. I'm not sure. Um, I had an opportunity to put a large number of bankruptcy documents out of PACER online. And I said I didn't want to be the sole provider on the internet of bankruptcy cases because I knew my phone would be ringing off the hook from outraged people. Um, I actually get phone calls because we have court of appeals documents online from people that were the plaintiffs that went to the Court of Appeals of the United States, but don't feel their cases should be available. And in some cases, those objections are valid, very valid. And in some cases, I had one gentleman who was the um, controller at a publicly traded company that was sued for securities fraud, and is currently the controller at a publicly traded company, and he doesn't want that case on the internet because people might get the wrong idea about him. Well, that seems to be public information. But if information is primary, and we're trying to understand what that means, and if it is public, I think a fundamental precept of this law.gov effort is that it should be available to all. And I understand that the data mining companies, for example, may be the prime users of the PACER database. On the other hand, public interest groups should be able to compete with those data mining companies. When we were able to access 20 million pages of PACER documents, something that, that the large, well-heeled credit companies have had for a long time, we found thousands of privacy violations, things that had festered in the database and nobody had an incentive to fix them. The court clerks did not have the time nor the responsibility for redacting information. The lawyers didn't care because nobody was calling them on the carpet. And for Lexus and West and the credit card companies, social security numbers were a feature and not a bug because they used it for their products. And it's only when public interest groups got access to the material that we were able to send the Judicial Rules Committee a detailed audit. It went to 30 district courts, and as a result, they were able to change their policies. And so law.gov is based on a question. 
can we make primary legal materials in the United States, all three branches, all levels of government, available in bulk from the source in an authenticated manner? And in today's day and age, one can, in fact, digitally sign documents. Now, that's not necessarily easy to do for a variety of reasons. Uh, for the archive, for example, authenticating and digitally signing prior documents that were on paper and are now scanned in is a difficult thing to do. And it's also difficult operationally doing this going forward for reasons such as privacy and improperly sealed and unsealed documents. So the basic principle is pretty simple. Now, I think there's three reasons that one needs to make these materials available. And those reasons are justice, democracy, and innovation, which are, are big words. Um, but I think they're real words. Justice. There is a feeling out there that any practicing professional, anybody who's serious about the law, has access to the materials they need to do their job. I don't believe that's true. I know many solo practitioners who do not have access to the services they need. They simply can't afford them. And, and solo practitioners and small startup firms, the general counsel of Twitter, was unable to justify access to the West database because it would have been by far the single largest line item on his budget, and he couldn't go to his boss and justify it. And this is by far the hottest startup on the internet right now, a wash in money. Now, maybe he was cheap and should have spent the money. Um, but I know a solo practitioner in northern Indiana, a good friend of mine, who as a hobby does pro bono work on water rights. He represents farmers whose streams get polluted by upstream manufacturers, and he cannot afford the services he needs, these specialized databases, because the surcharges are too high. Public interest lawyers, uh, legal defenders, many of them don't have access to the full deluxe legal packages, and that means people defending the poor don't have access to the same materials as people defending the rich. And that doesn't seem right. And there's one other category. Uh, my friend Tom Bruce runs the Cornell Legal Information Institute, which many of you may use. And they, they've been a pioneer uh, from the beginning in putting legal information online. He says one of the most common calls he gets from somebody is people saying, I'm just a government lawyer in the Department of Interior, and we don't have access to this specialized section of the United States Code. Thank you so much for putting it online for us. I get similar calls from other folks. Department of Justice lawyers get memos from their bosses saying, we are over budget. Please stop doing so much research. <laughs> Democracy is another reason. We say we're a nation of laws, not a nation of men. Well, that means we write down the law. And if we don't write down the law and make it available, then that doesn't make sense. Now, it, it, 10 or 20 years ago, it made sense that you had to go to a library to access this kind of information. But in today's day and age, it is much more than lawyers that need access to the law. I had an argument with the commissioner of patents <coughs> about whether the patent database should be available. And his argument was that it was the patent bar that needed patents because they were the only ones that read it. Well, every engineer in Silicon Valley needs to be able to read a patent because that's a fundamental part of, of their job. It's also a fundamental part of the patent database, which is there to promote the useful arts. Um, and if you don't make the patents available, what's the point in granting them? But I think the biggest reason is innovation. Today, if you want to be in the legal business, if you want to compete with West because you can do a better job on head notes or, or you can do a better shepherdizer, it will cost you anywhere from 10 to $50 million to purchase a collection of legal material sufficient to be able to provide a new service. Companies such as Fastcase spend tens of thousands of dollars per month simply triple keying material, sending them to India, having them typed, and getting the digital version back. And what that means is that innovation has not come to the legal market. It's the last bastion of clothes on the internet. If you look at science, if you look at finance, if you look at health, um, there has been a a uh, huge amount of information and a huge amount of startups that have gone in and, and have changed the way those professions practice, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. Um, but that, that innovation has been unavailable to the legal market. It's also 
unavailable to nonprofits and it's unavailable to the academy. And that's something that I think is really important. If you go um, to places like University of Michigan Law School, they have professors there and PhD students that, that have law degrees, but also very strong technical backgrounds that given the opportunity to analyze the corpus are able to find information like is there discrimination in civil rights cases in district courts? Does that vary across the country? Right? Um, is the idea of what a judge thinks is an important decision, is that different from what everybody else thinks is an important decision? And legal researchers are beginning to analyze the citation chain and, and build what are called big directed graphs to provide empirical evidence of which cases truly turned out to be important as opposed to the ones that the judge has named. So how do you change something so fundamental as a $10 billion a year industry, which is what it, um, access to primary legal materials is in the United States? Uh, the way we are doing this is a national conversation. A series of workshops and working groups is phase one of this process. We began at Stanford Law School. Erica Wayne and Paul Lomio um, set up our first law doc of workshop in January. Uh, we did a two-day technical workshop at Cornell that Tom Bruce hosted that had all the, the leading technical figures in, in the kind of free law um, world, as well as participants from LexisNexis and FastCase and the government printing office. Um, and so there's been a strong participation from industry and government. Um, at Columbia Law School, for example, Tim Wu um, was the co-convener of the workshop there. We had the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States, who does open government, Beth Novak, sitting next to the Chief Technology Officer of LexisNexis, discussing how primary legal materials could become more broadly available. Um, we had a workshop in Colorado just recently in which a Supreme Court Justice, the Chair of the Judiciary Committee, and the Secretary of State all discussed what the situation was in Colorado. Uh, we had two former past presidents of the American Association of Law Libraries there discussing um, uh, things like the Uniform Commission um, and efforts to standardize laws across the different states. We have a few more of these workshops coming up. We're going to finish this process in June. Uh, Texas is going to be on Tuesday with Terry Martin, who is the, um, the interim librarian down there, um, also a past president of the AALL. Uh, we'll be discussing the situation in Texas, but we'll also be looking again at research applications of the corpus. If the data were more broadly available, what could one do? Um, we're going to be in Berkeley in a couple of weeks. Uh, Professor Pam Samuelson is going to lead a session on intellectual property and the law. Are copyright um, constraints on legal materials valid or not? Uh, we will also have uh, Tim O'Reilly and our Secretary of State Deborah Bowen discussing government as a platform. And finally, a long in-depth session on privacy uh, with Peter Wynn from the Department of Justice and Chris Hufnagel from uh, Berkeley. And we're going to end this process up with two pretty big workshops. Uh, my former boss, John Podesta, I was the chief technology officer at the Center for American Progress, um, is hosting one on June 15th. Uh, we have a really stellar cast of, of people coming in for, for that one. The CEO of LexisNexis is going to be there, uh, the general counsel of the Office of Management and Budget, the law librarian of Congress. And then finally, we're going to Harvard because, of course, all roads lead to Cambridge. Uh, on June 18th, we'll be doing our final workshop uh, hosted by uh, John Palfrey, who is the associate dean and head of the law library. Along with the workshops, we have a series of working groups, uh, people working together online as well as at these meetings. Uh, the primary one is the National Inventory of Legal Materials, uh, which is co-sponsored uh, or has the strong participation of the American Association of Law Libraries. Uh, Erica Wayne will be speaking about that this afternoon, and she's been heading up that effort. Um, we are also doing outreach, attempting to go talk to judges. Uh, we will be in the United States Congress in a few weeks, where Congresswoman uh, Lofgren, uh, who is vice chair of the Committee on House Administration, is co-hosting a meeting with Congressman Lundgren, who is the ranking member on the Committee on House Administration. Uh, Roberta Schaefer will be there, but Eugene Meyer, the head of the Federalist Society, will be there. And I think the point of that event, it's a one-hour event, is to show that this issue is very much a nonpartisan, bipartisan, across the aisle type of issue. This is not a bunch of lefties or a bunch of righties um, with a particular agenda. This goes beyond the partisan politics that we often see in Washington. 
So phase one is the workshops. <coughs> phase two, we are attempting to distill what we're hearing and say, is there consensus on some things? Um, are there areas that are tough and there is no consensus? Um, and we will be issuing a report and a series of basic principles. For example, copyright assertions on primary legal materials. I think most people, or at least the ones we're hearing, are agreeing that that's probably not tenable, neither legally nor morally. And finally, we're going to go brief people and say, look, a national process has been underway. These are some of the conclusions. Uh, the United States Senate, uh, Senator Lieberman, who heads the e-government effort, has already asked for a copy of the report to be deposited to his committee. Uh, Chief Judge Kaczynski has granted me five minutes to brief the Ninth Circuit, um, and so I will practice my, my five-minute summaries. Um, a variety of other chief judges have asked for private briefings. Uh, the White House is extremely engaged in this process and has asked to be kept up to date, um, has sent people to a variety of these uh, workshops. You'll notice that this afternoon we will have Andrew McLaughlin, the Deputy Chief Technology Officer, and uh, David Ferriero, who is the Archivist of the United States, participating in this process. Uh, the basic presumption is that this requires national leadership. And the basic presumption is that we have a president who talk constitutional law, who if he sees a consensus and the issue is properly laid out, will understand this in about 30 seconds. We have a chief justice who is young and fairly progressive on issues of access to legal information. Uh, there are a variety of other people in the Congress and um, at the state level who believe this is an important issue. And I think our job in these workshops is to explore the issues and try to understand is there a consensus? Is there something we can present? And we have the ear right now of people in Washington. And we have the possibility, at least, of seeing some major changes in what I think is a really foundational issue for our system of justice. Um, if you look at the Constitution, it says, equal protection under the law shall not be denied. And the courts have ruled that that means that poll taxes, for example, are illegal. Access to the polls cannot be conditioned on access to a credit card. I think equal protection under the law also applies to the raw materials of our democracy. That access to the law cannot be preconditioned on access to a credit card, cannot be hidden behind a shrink wrap license agreement, cannot be hidden behind a copyright assertion. These are really basic materials that need to be available to everybody. So thank you so much for coming. Um, we have time for some more questions. And then this afternoon, I think we're going to have a very exciting program with, with not only the national inventory. We have Jennifer Jenkins is going to be speaking. And then we have these two uh, senior government officials that, that um, are going to take the time to come talk with us. So do we have any questions? Carl, since it's such a great idea, um, leaving aside the issues that Dean Levy spoke about, um, what are the fundamental misunderstandings or miscommunications that prevent people, people who don't have some financial stake in the current system, from seeing what you're talking about? For example, when you were talking about the head of the patent office, Dave uh, Kapos, who's you know, been very progressive on some other issues, you obviously disagree in the way that he's seeing it. He's seeing this as an access of the government competing with private industry, right? And sort of seen in that frame, this is your undercut, the, the state is taking on something. This is like the public option for information, right? You know, which as we know didn't fly so well in healthcare. So is that the problem? Is that the primary obstacle? Or is it the set of things that Dean Levy talked about? What's, what's the, given all the reasons you gave us, both the big ones and the just common sense ones, what are the reasons that those who don't have a current economic stake are actually resisting this? Um, now, what's interesting about the current economic stake is a lot of the people in the business, like LexisNexis and FastCase, spend a tremendous amount of time sourcing private materials. It costs them a lot of money. And so it, uh, there is a conception out there that industry would be 100% opposed to these efforts. But in reality, a lot of the more forward-thinking business folk are looking at this effort and saying, this could be very good for us because we believe that we do things better than our competitors. But there is a feeling among many that this would be competing with the private sector, that we are somehow going to be nationalizing the law, and that that would be a bad thing. And so that, that's certainly one, one issue. 
there is the issue of That's this. I never, yeah. never imagined that it was private to begin with. So. <laughs> um, that there are so many problems in the database that it would be irresponsible to make this data available. Um, and I think the issue there is that we have ignored privacy. And despite the leading efforts, I, I wish Dean Levy were here to hear me say this, um, judges like him who, who helped forge the privacy rules did a wonderful job. But because there was no enforcement, many of the lawyers ignored the privacy issues. And we had the feeling that somehow, if it was just available on West and Lexis and on Pacer, it wasn't really a problem. And that, that's an issue that I think needs to be dealt with. What I found when I put information on the internet is I got immediate feedback from people saying, oh my god, you got my case on the internet. And in some cases, those were, you know, um, what, what we have, by the way, is a privacy policy that says if anybody writes to us and says, we don't want to see this case on Google, we don't care if you were a party, we don't care what your reason is, we don't want to hear your reason, please, um, we will list that case in the robots.txt file. Right, so it doesn't show up on Google. Now, we warn people that we're only one provider, and everybody else has copies of these public documents. And the issue there is that we have not, as a society, confronted our privacy obligations. We simply let them fester. And I think my proposition is that if the judiciary and the executive branch and the legislative branch explicitly decide what is public and not and what the rules are, we will be better off as a society. And by the way, privacy issues are not simply the judiciary. I found 500,000 social security numbers in the congressional record, believe it or not. And we got West and Lexus to voluntarily redact those. We got the government printing office to take it off their website. Uh, but it's still out there in printed copies. Uh, this was front page of Stars and Stripes, so this is no secret that, that I'm telling you. Um, and then the final issue that we're confronting on Law.gov is what I call the jaw dropper, which is when I go see a chief judge in a federal court and I say, did you know eight courts assert copyright on state statutes? Their jaws drop. They go, no, that can't be possible. And, and I think there is um, a misunderstanding out there on the extent in which this public property has become private parcels, in which it has been fenced off. Uh, the state of California, for example, if you want to access final opinions of the courts, you have to go to a website, and before you can access that website, you agree that this is for non-commercial use, you won't copy the stuff, you won't redistribute it, and if you wanted to make a copy of the California court opinions, you have to get a very, very expensive license. And I think a lot of policymakers, particularly in Washington, are just unaware of the extent to which our legal system has been, been turned into private property.